Happy Tuesday, everyone! This is Human Factors Cast, episode 34. We got some great stories to talk about today. Robots, AI, the projected uprising, and how the Navy wants gamers to help stop it. We also have a lot of VR and AR from places you might not expect. We want you to put on your space boots because Human Factors Cast starts right now. to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. This is going to be an interesting one. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today, uh, hopefully, by Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, I'm here for the moment, that's for sure. Okay, so here's the story. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf is over there. In ATL, Atlanta, for those of us in the States. And right as we were preparing for tonight's show, guess what happened? Oh, the power exploded. No! Definitely off. So, Blake is calling in from his phone right now. Blake, I don't know, can you even read the stories? Oh, I've got the Google Drive app. We can do this. Okay, we can We can totally do this. Okay, great. Um, I also have Alexa. Say hi. Okay, she doesn't want to. She's shy. But uh, she's also here if we need her. I, I doubt it. But anyway, it's me and Blake holding down the fort. <laughs> Blake, this is amazing. This is this is you can't get better than this. The power of technology. Well, even though silly stuff's happened over here, how are you this week, Nick? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I've been playing a lot of that Horizon Zero Dawn game for PlayStation. I just got to say, it's a wonderfully constructed game that makes me want to play. Like I, I don't want to podcast right now. I want to go play that. I've heard great things. So you're telling me that the hype stacks up to the game? The hype stacks up, man. It's uh you know most games have that kind of scavenge and and produce and uh kill sort of loop mechanic, but they they, they just do it so well in this game. It's just like it, it always feels satisfying to score a score a kill on one of these robot dinosaurs or um, uh, you know, upgrade your stuff. Like, there's always something to do, and it's always rewarding when you get challenges done. I would recommend any of our listeners who are on the fence about that one to pick it up. All right, but since you are on limited battery, let's go ahead and jump right into the show, man. Uh, this is the part of the show all about human factors news. Now, this could be anything from AI, like we talked about the last couple weeks, virtual reality, automation, psychology, design, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's fair game as long as it has to do with the field of human factors blake go ahead and read the first story all right so jump right into it researchers at mit's man vehicle lab want to make it easier for astronauts to walk on the moon with boots and other wearables that provide haptic feedback warning users of obstacles they might not see so at first this may seem a little silly adding sensors to boot but it's actually a serious consideration as incidents like tripping or falling use up valuable breathable air when an astronaut expends too much energy The boots will have a built-in range-finding sensor that uses haptic feedback or vibrations to tell the user how close they are to an unseen moon rock or antenna. They start slow and speed up as an obstacle gets closer, a bit like the proximity alert you see in backup cameras in cars. Now, Nick, this is another wearable this week. How stoked are you on these? I want my moon boots. (laughs) These these are awesome. These are so cool. It's like a... a, and, and, And... for reasons that I didn't even think about. Like, this is just amazing to me. Um, I'm always jazzed by, like, the amount of marginal gains that we can sort of um, engineer around, right? Like, they're talking about tripping or falling in space, wasting oxygen for these astronauts. And they're solving the problem by making it less uh, easy, the easier for... Um, less easier for them to trip, easier for them to avoid tripping and falling. Yeah, it was interesting because basically they're solving it by adding vibrators to shoes. But it, I wonder what that would be like, <laughs> like from a this sensory used to be a family show. Right? This 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 used to be a family show. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but like I, I was thinking, like how I don't. You'd have to really get used to that. Like thinking, like oh, what the. What's going on? Is this like an earthquake on the moon? But I'm sure it's like a, a little slower feedback than just oh, sure. jolting. 
But it's a it's a really cool idea to put like sensors that help people or help I guess astronauts only sure avoid any kind of obstacles. Yeah, I I kind of really cool. I kind of see this like that um that uh other thing that we talked about a couple weeks ago with the uh the, like the wrist mounted navigation device where it kind of vibrates if you're going in the right direction. It it's all kind of leading towards that haptic feedback, which is interesting to me. Because oh, yeah, it's... lots of haptic feedback in all of these, like, kind of wearable technologies. And the one you're talking about, I know, like, it was more app-based, but it's uh, it's interesting. It's a new, or it's not really a new technology, but it's new to see it in clothes, I guess. For sure, for sure. All right, we're talking about space. What's up next? All right, so speaking of astronauts and space gear, Buzz Aldrin made an appearance at this, we're South by, this year's South by Southwest conference to talk about the future of space travel and VR. Buzz showcased a VR experience called Cycling Pathways to Mars that features a hologram of Buzz describing the solar system as well as his vision for colonizing Mars itself. He envisions having two ships constantly cycling between Earth and Mars on six-month schedules, taking advantage of when the planets line up favorably for moving back and forth between the systems. Smaller launchers would dock to the two big cycling ships and head down to Mars's moon and eventually down to the planet's surface. The goal of the VR experience was to provide a way to visualize what would be required to make colonizing Mars a reality. I feel like he and or he's probably gotten a lot of people excited, but I I wonder if Elon Musk is hopping on this too because I know that was like a pet dream of his at some point. Oh yeah, was colonizing Mars. Uh, for any of our listeners, I I get asked frequently by our listeners uh, by, via email, and maybe we should just do a feedback section section session where uh, they ask me like what what podcast I listen to, and I've mentioned Star Talk a couple times on the show. Uh, they they actually just did an episode with Elon Musk. It's really interesting. They they kind of interview him. But in terms of going to Mars, I don't know if he'd be on board with this because, uh, well, I mean, he could steal the idea, obviously, and make it his. But I really dig this idea. Um, the human factors piece of this is the VR experience, and I'm a little less blown away by that. I feel like he's just using a really, uh, what's the word, uh, sort of sexy tool right now that's out there to kind of promote his idea, which is fine. But, I mean, I haven't tried it. I, I, I want to try this thing. I, I want to know if this really gets across this idea because as you were reading the story and as I read it earlier this week and as we posted it on our Facebook site uh, <laughs> and Twitter, um, like, I I totally got the idea just from reading this. So, I, I, I sorry, go ahead. Oh, my bad. I didn't say anything. You just skipped. Oh, oh no, no, no. Okay. So, yeah, no, I just want to know what VR adds to the description. Like, I mean, there's always that whole you can't describe VR to someone who hasn't experienced it. And then once you have, it's like you can't ever, you know, know what that's not like. And then, but I just want to know, like, what that's like. Anyway. Yeah, I had a similar question, too. I mean, because they talk about in the article how this experience or whatever was really good for demonstrating the things we would need to build for this to actually happen. But at the same time, I didn't understand why VR was the way to experience it. I mean, I, f I feel like you could model this in just programs or if it's ship ideas and things like that. I don't know that VR was the only way to do it. I, I agree with you. I think it was just like the sexy version. I mean, this was at South by Southwest and we all know right. that VR was a big topic there. So yeah. I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm wondering. So cool and it would be good to see. You know, I'm wondering yeah. if he actually, if if they built it in, like, something easily transferable to VR, like Unity or something, and they just said, hey, <laughs> we already built the assets in a 3D environment. Here's, uni here's you know, an Oculus Rift. You can view it in Unity. And I, I wonder if they just tacked it on. I don't know. All right. What's up next? All right. So we're talking a little bit about AR and VR for the next few stories. So in my opinion... There's no better use of AR or VR than as a hi-fi training tool. And Lowe's has teamed up with Google to help you to help you with learning how to do home improvement in your own home. So Lowe's used Google's Tango software to launch a host of high-tech AR and VR initiatives. They've developed an AR tablet app that allows users to find the exact item they're looking for by wandering through the store digitally through the app. Lowe's, Lowe's has also been testing a vr how to 
experience for activities like tiling a shower using the HTC, HTC Vive to make the experience more interactive. Lowe's is currently testing a sample release of these high-tech initiatives before rolling them out franchise-wide. So there's a lot of cool things about this particular story, but I really like to hear that they're sample testing the ideas they have, gathering feedback before launching like a full-scale deal. Yeah, no, this is, um, I was going to say this is interesting, but, uh, oh. Oh, I know, I know I caught myself. No, this is really a good thing for procedural instructions. So obviously for people who, um, I don't, I don't know. So like, uh, there's, you get more from, from learning how to do things when you can actually interact with the components, right? So like for me, I, I used to ride motorcycles and and uh, watching a YouTube video on how to change your battery was really scary because you're taking apart pieces to get to the battery and you're like, oh, crap, well, I don't know how to put them back the right way. And so, but if you could learn in, a, in an environment where you could still interact with the pieces, but there's no chance of you screwing it up, like, that's awesome. And so the fact that Lowe's and is, is taking VR and AR uh, to basically show you how to do these things overlaid in your actual environment there there's less risk because you know it can analyze that that environment that you're in and be like you put it here and you know there's you can't screw it up if it says where to put it exactly and i, I feel like it'd be really cool to learn to do have some of this home improvement stuff on your own like i don't know maybe with your spouse or whatever doing these like going in store or eventually maybe even in home and just walking through how to i don't know put tile in your shower if you want to replace it or figuring out how to build a whole another sink or anything like that. So it's a, it's an awesome idea. I'm, I'm glad that they're implementing it right um, in two very different ways. Yeah. Well, and, and then pottery barn is doing something similar too. we, we posted them as two separate links, but I mean, this, this story kind of applies to that too. They're, they're doing this thing where you can basically go in and uh, you know, place sort of what, what an item would look like in your home before you actually go and buy it. So so these companies are really hopping on the VR AR train. Uh I, and I I I I don't I don't want to attribute it to Pokemon Go, but I mean just the technology is getting there and it's getting more widespread than ever. And so it's making it a lot easier for for people to jump in and and do this. Oh yeah, and it seems like Tang, uh, Google's Tango software is really making it simple. Although I did see a drawback across both the Lowe's article and the Pottery Barn article that it's like, for as far as AR AR is going uh, with Tango, it's limited to only two type types of tablets. So there's kind of a limiting factor. But I mean, these are big stores; they're probably going to deploy only the stuff it works on anyway. Right. Um, all right. All right. What? Let's move on. What's up next? All right, since we already kind of talked about the Party Barn app and related it, I'm just going to kind of keep moving. So I have a question for Alexa. Hang on. Let me get her ready. Oh, go right ahead. Okay, go ahead. All right. Alexa, how would you like it if you had a face? I don't have an opinion on that. Well, that's just too bad. But anyway, so... The group, a group in a group called Project Yorick, may be able to <laughs> make your dreams come true if you actually had an opinion and wanted a face. Um. Albeit, they do it in a pretty unnerving way. So, Project Yorick has developed an Alexa hack that allows for chattering teeth, googly eyed, googly eyes, a chattering teeth, googly eyed skull to be attached to Alexa and answer all of your questions. All you need is the group's three axis skull kit and a raspberry Pi to have your very own crypt keeper with Alexa's voice. So Nick, I'm sure you tweeted this out earlier in the week, but I this did. is the scariest looking thing that there is. Oh, this is amazing. I, uh, I want, uh, I want one of these. Curious to me. I want one of these because it, um, I would love for her to just talk to me with that, with that stupid skull just chattering. Anyway, I, uh, this is this is not really a story. This is just an excuse to talk about it because it was awesome. 
Yeah, it's it's such a goofy thing. And, you know, it seems like they had to put in some serious work to make it happen, which is the best part. You know what, though? Let's bring this back to human factors for a sec. So we're talking about Alexa having a face. Sorry, I can't find the answer to the question. I. Yeah, so, so we're ha- talking about her having a face. But there's a reason behind that. Because just talking to a disembodied voice doesn't, it's not something that we're used to. I mean, unless you talk to God, in which case, good for you. But that's that's not typically found, right, in, in nature. You're not talking to disembodied voices. So by attaching this skull to Alexa, you're effectively giving her uh, a, a robotic face to interact with. Well, this, this is a super interesting point, Nick, and it ties into the very next story. But I wonder, I'm starting to wonder, based on, like, the the voice they chose for Alexa by default. is very, it's human and it's feminine. Something you can attribute a human quality to. So right. I'm wondering if that's why companies pick to, like, give their AI voices human-sounding voices, either male or female. Uh, yeah. in place of not having a face. Yeah, we did a whole... Right. I think I'd be more comfortable if, it, if like, with, an, with a robot or whatever that had something that I could look at and be like, oh, that's kind of like me. Um, no, you're right, you're right. And we did a whole episode in our very infancy phases of Human Factors Cast on how computers are social actors, and I'd like to revisit that topic because uh, if you go back and listen to our early episodes, it was kind of it was kind of rough. I think we kind of really found our groove now, but... um. Yeah, so there's there's a whole field out there about why humans interact better with robots and computers that socialize in the same way that humans do. But speaking of that, why don't we move on to the next story? Because I feel like it's a really good segue. For sure. Yeah. Okay. So Intel announced that it will be releasing a new smartwatch, the Connected Modular 45, later this year. The watch was praised for its aesthetic features, but Intel also announced that the watch will include a genderless AI assistant. The AI assistant will have contextual responses like Siri and Google AI and will be able to extrapolate and understand data provided by the smartwatch. Intel's choice to create a genderless AI makes sense as Google and Apple and and also Amazon have received criticism over the default feminine AI. The question then becomes, what will the genderless AI sound like? I have no idea. I don't either. They they made some cool assumptions in the article. They were like they were like maybe it'll sound like Wally, or they had a few other ones like that. But th- I didn't even think of that. I was just like, oh, it'll just sound like a robot. What's so, a robot sound like? Yeah. So, well, for me, like I I can relate this to I don't know. It's hard with human vernacular because there is this big okay. We all know I'm a Star Wars nerd here, but before the Force Awakens dropped, everyone was questioning whether or not BB-8 was male or female. And, uh, you know, if you heard BB-8's noises that it makes, um, you can't really discern that from the noises. I mean, the actors that provided the, the sound effects were male, but it, it was intentionally ambiguous. I mean, they later identified BB-8 as a male droid. You're assigning sex to a robot, but or gender, rather, sorry. And, and But, I mean, yeah, I have no idea what a genderless robot would sound like yeah and you know i i like it it mentioned in the article like there was criticism on like google and apple and amazon's behalf for choosing like a feminine default well okay Um, okay hang on there's there's actually some backed research on that and i mean agree or disagree with it all you like but the reason they pick a female voice is because it's it's uh God, I hate the results of this study, but it's seen as um, a more passive um, entity, and so like it's just so sexist. It's 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 stupid. I hate it, but that's why they choose that is because it's it, it, people will get less likely to get upset at their devices when it's um, you know a, a servant that is female giving them what they want it's so sexist and so stupid i hate it i could get really fired up about this but i won't i mean that's that's why they pick them though so the fact that who is this intel is is developing a genderless ai that's great that's great although i honestly don't know if it'll do as well as the other 
other, uh, you know, AIs that are gendered female because of that reason. Honestly, I don't, I don't think it's going to do as well whether you choose the default feminine version or you switch it to a male version. I don't think it's going to do as well because you're not going to connect with it as much, especially when it's coming out of just your watch in this case. Uh, I don't know. It'll it'll be interesting, though, because, I mean, Intel's put out a lot of good products. I mean, and maybe the, maybe it'll set a totally different trend maybe for they'll, how people deal with AI. Yeah, maybe they'll crack the code finally. All right. Robots, AI, what's up next? All right. I'm ready over here. <laughs> All right. So we're jumping into some robot stories here. So a lot of stories we've covered in the last few weeks deal with advancement in AI and robots that has people wondering about job security. Well, Kyoto's Advanced Telecommunications Research Institute premiered robot Erica and proved there's at least one job robots can't take, and that's rapping. That's right, robots can't <laughs> rap, and Erica made that abundantly clear in a video released by Kyoto of the robot performing Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight. However, all joking aside, watching the video closely reveals that Kyoto was really showcasing that robots like Erica learn by studying human-to-human -human interactions and use what they observe to act and respond more naturally through body movements and even spoken responses. And I think Nick has a little clip. For I, oh, I do. I do. Have you have you heard this? I haven't heard it. We talked about it before <laughs> the cast. I'm kind of excited to hear it. Oh, man. You didn't even hear the best part, though. I'm, I'm just going to play this to the end. I think it's like a... Eh, I won't play it all the way through. I'll, I'll play like this first little bit. And then uh, hopefully I can get the second bit here. Hang on. Check it out. I'm the E to the R, the I C the A, and I'm built for HRI. Say what? My silicone brings all the bots to the yard, and these reasons I tell you why. Check it out. I'm the state of the art, the top of the line, and I'm rapping to the rhythm. Yo, Rob OV, you know I can learn too with a similar algorithm. <laughs> okay, so that's that's pretty ridiculous. Hang on. I, I The ending is pretty good too. Hang on, I'll just play that for us really quick. For example, data driven HRI. If you're having robot problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems. But learning by imitation from human to human interactions ain't one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come oh. on. <laughs> oh, I was waiting for that. That's the part that I didn't show you earlier. <laughs> That's just too good. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, another fun story that we just wanted to throw in there to talk about. But human factors, human factors, human-robot interaction is a thing. Honestly, it still blows my mind that that's like, it's basically just machine learning and watch and like just gathering data from watching human interaction. I mean, none, nonetheless, as goofy as that is, that's it's still scary. pretty dang cool. And it's scary, too, because what happens when they learn us completely? What What happens if they understand human behavior better than we understand human behavior? As yeah, behavioral scientists. There you go. And something that could even be limiting them, it may be the hardware they're given and some of the voice modulation they're using now that's limiting what they can actually do, not necessarily the algorithm itself. Oh, hold up a sec. Alexa, can you rap? My name is Alexa, and I'm here to say I'm the baddest AI in the cloud today. Your responses are fast, but mine are faster. Sucker speech engines. They call me master. Whoa! Whoa! It's on fire! Oh my god! Dang! I am like blown away. Okay, honest, honestly, that was not rehearsed to our listener. I'm actually really blown away by that. That's an awesome Easter egg. That's quite good. That's I'm... fantastic. Uh, Alexa's just got it all, man. <laughs> Dang! Now, well, well I, I do have to say, Erica has got nothing on Alexa. Oh, for sure, yeah. That's insane. Oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. What's what's up next? All right. So i got a question for all you guys. Nick, this applies to you, too. Yes. I told you the robot specifically built to drill holes in human skulls was a great thing. What would you say? Uh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, trust me, this robot is changing the possibilities of robotic, sur robotic surgery, particularly that of microsurgery. For surgeries like cochle cochlear, always mess this up, cochlear implants, extreme precision is required as the slightest deviation or involuntary movement can result in permanent damage. So researchers at the University of Berm have been working on a robot that performs the most delicate and potentially 
damaging step of drilling into the human skull at, preci at the precise location and depth to give access to the right part of the cochlea. They even they are even looking into it as a potential process. Regardless of the frightening imagery of a robot drilling into your skull, researchers at Burn believe that this will be a much neat needed consistency in surgical procedures like this. Now, the title of this story freaked me out at first, but <laughs> at the very end, this is awesome. I I really I really like the way the medical field is going and the fact that they are embracing uh technology in 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 medicine and and you know, there's a lot of jobs in human factors for people who are actually creating these things, these these interactions that you have to have with this skull drilling robot. Yeah. And it, the, the thing I didn't understand was how long a lot of the like su robotic surgery have been going on. Like it's been going on for decades. Oh yeah. I guess it's getting just much more talked about in the news uh, as like robotics just keep flying and advancing, man. I mean, look, here's the thing. Like I, I love, I love technology because it, it, replaces the burden of having to do all this manual labor on the very person who can do this the, the one of the only people who can do this which is the doctor right it replaces the burden on them to drill this fine hole into somebody's head a robot does it and then they can really focus on the implantation and the bedside manner and and all that that other really important stuff right like it to me it just blows my mind that it's like in any job you automate the boring uh repetitive dangerous tasks so that way the humans are are less involved with those tasks but and and they can focus their uh resources on more uh, you know uh, more important things yeah and this is actually an interesting point because in the next story we really we all right well, why don't we go ahead and, <laughs> so, why don't we go ahead and so, get into it yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, like we mentioned uh, in this pr in the previous story, robots are super helpful in the surgical theater, ensuring pinpoint accuracy. But as robots become more advanced, they often become more autonomous. The question is then, how much autonomy should robots be given in the operating room? Science, ro yeah, science robotics has developed a grading scale for autonomy in robot assisted surgery, and believes. That if it's adopted, the scale could help regulators like the FDA decide what level of autonomy would be appropriate. The scale ranges from zero, no autonomy, to five, full, fully autonomous, and can be used to rate the type of robot that could be used in, in specific surgical procedures. So, this, I mean, what we talked about a second ago was just how how well that the medical field is taking in like removing a operator out from what automation can do. Right. But apparently in a lot of surgeries, you, there are even options that you could use a fully autonomous agent to do some of the surgery. Right. Uh, so, it, and, and this is, this is kind of coming out everywhere. Cause we've talked a lot about the department of transportation having to figure out rules for, for automation. And yeah. now we're talking about it in the surgical realm. I mean, it never has been better or more fun to be a human factor scientist. That's oh, for sure. yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, this is cool. They they put in this uh, little graphic here that kind of shows you um, it's like humans on one side and a robot on the other <laughs> doing surgery. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, this reminds me of the levels of automation, and they probably just modified it for surgical use. Uh, I have to remind myself. But I, I mean, yeah, no, this, this, like, completely ties into what we were just saying, where those dangerous jobs for people to perform, or, um, oh, it, it looks like they've halved the ten levels of automation and basically just said, you know, hey, hey, there's five now <laughs> for, but I, I like this more concise model just because it's, it's a little bit more, um, yeah, especially for surgery, like, like. Level three here, conditional autonomy. Operator selects uh, uh, and approves a surgical plan, and the robot performs the procedure automatically, but with close surgical oversight by the human. So, I mean, they they define it in the sense of medical, which is which is cool. I like this. 
Yeah, I do too. I mean, and I like that it's forward thinking, like go ahead and look in the future, realize that the FDA and other organizations are going to have to make these calls. So starting to think about it now is probably the wisest choice. Right, right, for sure. All right, uh, Blake, how's your battery doing? Oh, uh, we're good. We're ten percent. Okay, okay. All right. So if uh, Human Factors Cast abruptly ends, you know why. Um, okay, what's up next? Let's get through as All many right. stories as we can. All right, yeah, yeah. So diving deeper into the advances of robotics in the medical field, DARPA has devised the automatic magnometer. Uh, man, for biological imaging in Earth's native terrain or magnetometer. Am- magnetometer there it is yeah. this is hard to see on a phone for sure <laughs> but anyway short for short they call it ambient and plans to incorporate the technology and they and darpa plans to incorporate the technology into prosthetic limbs ambient basically isolates and shields the earth's strong magnetic frequencies from a piece of equipment so that then the middle school ones produced by the human body can do things like control artificial limbs with the weak magnetic waves that are produced by thoughts. This is too crazy. DARPA states that that potentially on the horizon, for example, are sensor are sensor systems for detecting spinal signals, diagnosing concussions, and brain machine interfaces using the ambient technology. Now I would love to dive a little deeper, like go to DARPA's website and look for this specific project. Right. Because like Maybe I'm wrong, and if you know Nick, correct me, but I feel like a lot of times some of their stuff is more stays in the thought of experiment stage, and yeah. I want to know how far this is going to go. Cause this is this like some of the imagery they use, I don't know if it's specific to this project, but this looks like the next thing to really help people actually be able to use their prosthetic limbs like hands. Right. Yeah, no, the um... – I, I I think that DARPA overall is just more thought experiment e, but they also have some very applied things like that that hover bike came out of DARPA. Yeah, um, very true. So, and that that uh, death dog robot thing that came out of DARPA. I believe this is one of the more developed ideas. Uh, they're 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 just using brain waves essentially to. Uh, to control this prosthetic device on your arm, right? That's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm that's understanding. Yeah, I mean, the the bigger part of the technology, it seems like, is dulling down the Earth's magnetic pull, and then a, which allows the brain frequencies to slip through and actually give you control of the limb. Yeah, that sounds very uh, I don't know, science fictiony. I, it does. It sounds a lot like cybernetics and becoming a cyborg because I can't imagine. Like, let's say you didn't have from forearm down, like where, what <laughs> connections are being made that send, I guess, nerve impulses, but that's probably not what, that's not what they're describing. They're describing just the magnetic frequencies that your right. brain transmits. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, they also talk oh, a little bit about HBIs. Like a, they also talk a little bit about HBIs too. Yeah. Um, yeah in so the future. It's like a combination of all of it. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely some cool, cool advances in uh, the medical field. For sure. There's a lot of medical stuff this week. All right, let's 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 switch it up a little bit. What's up next? All right. So as we talked about on the show, cybersecurity is a big problem as more and more of our data is collected and stored. Oh, hey, Blake. Blake, Blake, Blake. I'm, I'm losing you a little bit, buddy. Um, oh, no. I know. Shoot. Well, I got 9%. Keep reading or you can take over. Oh, man. All right. Well, uh. You know what? I hate to cut it short. I, I'm, I think I'll just take uh, take a couple of these stories, and uh, make some quick comments on them, and then then we'll have to pick it back up next week when uh, the power is not out. Uh, good. Uh, well, yeah, sorry, I'm having issues this week, but uh, have a wonderful rest of the week. All right, Blake, you take it easy. All right, man. All right. Well, thank you, Blake, for being on the show. All right, so now that Blake's gone, I have gone and scoured the internet for another personality to help me break down the last couple stories, and I came up with my friend here, Nick Porter, from New York. Nick, how you doing? I'm doing all right. How you doing, Nick? I'm doing good, Nick. Nick and Nick, just hanging out, talking about Human Factor stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and take over reading the news stories here since Blake is no longer with us. I mean, he'll be back next week, but the power outage, I, I don't know, Nick, so... 
let me introduce Nick to our audience. Nick has been a longtime friend of mine for a while, and he's just he's coming in to help me sort of talk about these things like Blake would, except now I'm going to read the stories. Nick, how are you doing? Let me just banter with you a little bit. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Trying to stay warm over here in Buffalo, New York. We've had some pretty intense snowstorms last week. We actually had driving bans, and I couldn't go into work with a few other friends. It was so bad. But uh, other than that, doing all right. Just uh, going through the motions, trying to stay warm. Good, good. Uh, well, I'm I'm glad that your power is not out. <laughs> and, it was. <laughs> uh, it was. All right. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, I saw the pictures. That was crazy over there, man. We're talking yeah, about we the- like 20.5 <laughs> inches in like 48 hours. Great. That's, that's it. Well, I mean, you got a lot of gaming in while you were, while you were locked in. Yeah, yeah, I sure did. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to these news stories. Nick, just, just, uh, provide your commentary on it. You know, we, we, we talk about this stuff all the time and it's just going to be for our oh, listeners. Yeah. So, okay. So up first, Netflix is switching its rating scale from the five star rating system for a more binary thumbs up and thumbs down scale. The entertainment giant has been testing this switch across user base throughout 2016, and from the sample, they saw a 200% increase in ratings across viewers. Netflix made the switch in hopes that more viewers will rate shows more frequently to improve their percent match feature, ensuring that it's recommending shows that match your tastes accurately. You'll see this change roll out sometime over the globe in the next coming months. Nick, we talked about this briefly before you came on. It sounds like you have strong opinions on it. I'm wondering what you're thinking about this thing. Well, I mean, I, I do understand their need to get more participation using a sim- such a simpler system. I mean, see, see is how it works so successfully with like Pandora and now Spotify implementing it with their radio a lot more. But I, I do feel like when it co- comes to something a little bit more elaborate as like a TV show or a movie, something you could be dedicated in and that takes a significant amount of time to enjoy – that a five-star rating system, even in my personal experience, seems much more accurate for something that I want to watch. So accuracy and participation is interesting, and it has a really interesting sort of uh, relationship here, right? Because they're looking for user engagement. And for me personally, when I when I watch a Netflix show, I'm like, eh, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to think about. Part of it is the resolution, right? So I can't give it two and a half stars. I was neutral on it, uh, right? They give you three. Um, so you can't rate half stars. That's first off. Second off, uh, it just turns me off because it, it, it requires me to think. If you, pr- if you introduce a binary system for users to respond to, it's either, yes, I liked that. No, I didn't. And if you didn't have an opinion on it, you just leave it blank. So it's, it's almost think about it like two stars will be thumbs down, two stars and below rather three stars will be neutral. So no thumbs up, no thumbs down and four or five stars will be thumbs up. So it's, it's a lot easier from a user perspective to make that gut check and be like, uh, Prometheus, no, didn't like it. Uh, Star Wars, yeah, liked it. Uh, you know, and it's just like one of these things where you, where you can go through and then the algorithm will also be refined because then, you know, you, you're, you're, I mean, it's a little less data for that algorithm, but if you have more sample size, you're going to get more information. Yeah, and I... I too totally agree with with that mindset too in in terms of not having to think about it and making it a little bit more of a casual and leisurely process to kind of recommend or or shoo away. Um, I would be, you know, not opposed to the thumbs up, thumbs down system. Maybe if there was also a middle option as well, like maybe if it was just a general, would you recommend this thumbs up, thumbs down, or maybe something like that, that, I mean, again, still can kind of give you a little bit more of an idea without having to think so much about it, but still giving more of an option versus just a yes or no. All right. So you're thinking like middle of the road, like I don't want to say that I had no opinion on it. I just want to say that I felt neutral about it, right? There's a difference between there's a difference between omission um, and sort of acknowledgement of it was a neutral feeling for me. Yeah, like it wasn't great. I wouldn't necessarily seek out to watch it again, but if it was on, I wouldn't turn it off. Well, it'll definitely be something interesting to check out over the next couple months. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next story here. Amazon. They have given us the ability to shop online at a mass scale. They produced a wonderful AI that's sitting right here with us. Alexa, say hi. Hi there. Yep. And then, uh, let's see, where was I? Oh, yeah. Now, they're going to help you be fashionable. So Amazon has added an outfit compare feature uh, for Prime members on its shopping app. So basically, what this does is it, 
prompts users to share two photos of themselves wearing two separate different outfits that they're deciding between, right? So basically, you send your pictures of you dressing up into Amazon, and then you'll get a response from an Amazon stylist who will tell you which outfit uh, looks better. And this this information is based on what looks best on you, how that how that clothing is styled, how those clothes fit on you, and what's in trend. So Amazon will more repeatedly use these photos to make some suggestions for shopping ads. So on one hand, you get shopping advice, but on the other hand, they get data on what looks good on you and can tailor that to your personalized shopping experience. Nick, do you have any thoughts on this? You know, I do. I feel like there's a hundred different factors in, included in something like that. I mean, first of all, the sheer number of people that would have to be available to answer a question like that, maybe possibly the amount of knowledge and research they would have to have. Also, you know, maybe taking in consideration the person's po- body type and, you know, maybe a bunch of other things. But, it, you know, the more human to human touch, I do think might be uh, much more attractive to a lot of people that are indecisive about what they wear. Right. So I think the big thing with this is that uh, initially, I think they're doing Amazon stylists, right, who will sit behind the behind the scenes yeah. and kind of analyze these things. And then they'll take that data, pump it into an artificial intelligence system that will then make those decisions based on what the humans have determined is a good way to, or a good way to dress. So. Eventually, yeah, you'll lose that human interaction because you'll get people who are uh, you. You'll just get the AI's decision. Yeah, I, I do think that the the um, the subjective nature of something like that being replaced with an I with an AI is kind of a scary thought. Like that kind of can tie into you know kind of like replacing human you know human touch i just feel like you know how do you think i look and then having a computer saying oh you look great or something like that just kind of seems eerie yeah so well i mean that kind of all leads up to uh the singularity right i mean we're yeah. we're talking about this this robot uprising we we always talk about it on the show um and we talked about it a lot with alexa a couple weeks ago but uh, uh that that's a great segue into our next story uh are you a gamer nick Oh yeah, always. Oh yeah, you're a gamer. We game together all the time. Uh, well, the <laughs> office, the office of naval research needs your assistance in stopping the AI uprising. They're launching a week long MMO, so that's for non gamers, massively multiplayer online. They're calling it a war game, leveraging the internet, aka MMO WGLI. Sounds like a radio station. You're listening to. Hang on, hang on. I gotta get the uh, special effects here. You're listening to MMO. WGLI in the morning with Nick and Nick. Oh, I totally messed that up. Oh, well, that's okay. (laughs) Whoa, I still got the echo going on. All right. Anyway, the idea behind this is that they're crowdsourcing ideas from gamers on how to deal with the inevitable onset of the singularity. Gamers will be able to post ideas and interact with each other to devise solutions to the futuristic problem. Ideas that manage to reach critical mass in the game. So these ideas that basically gain a lot of steam may be adopted and put into action. So this is this is really cool. They're crowdsourcing how to deal with the singularity effectively. Yeah, I think that is uh that's really interesting. That's like really putting it into the minds of people that they know think about things like this all the time, like yes. the gamers. Like yes. the there's this so like the government go, go ahead no no no. go ahead you're the guest well, so, so yeah so it's so it's like the government saying hey we do this all day long but let's let's give it to the nerds and gamers that obviously can think about dramatic scenarios like this and what their thoughts are yeah so there's a lot of overlap between sort of the demographics that play video games and the um the 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 demographics that uh are interested in sci-fi and robots and computers and stuff, right? There's, there's a correlation there. As, as stereotypical as it is to say, there is a, a, a correlation there, and they are tapping into that. Um, the, uh, the director of disruptive technology at the ONR actually remarked that technology have, has advanced to the point where we can see the singularity on the horizon, but what we can't see is what lies over that horizon. That's where we need help from players. So overall... I think this is super cool. Nick, let's go ahead and play this game sometime next week. We can we can uh, try to crowdsource some excellent ideas to stop the AI uprising. <laughs> I'm down. Let's see how many Terminator usernames we can find. All right. Nick, Nick, have you uh, – so fake news has been a thing in the news lately. 
fake news has been news. Have you have you been keeping up with this fake news stuff? You know, a little bit. I mean, hearing all kinds of rumors about places like Fox News, you know, has always kind of been like more of the shady sources and people say that, you know, they are kind of puppeteers for certain things for the higher ups. But yeah, I, I do feel like fake news is, is a problem and only for a lot of people that don't have a lot of opinions or look too deeply into things, but they see a big branded name slapped on something and they think it's absolutely true. Yep. That's exactly what this article is saying. So basically, if you're like me, you always think that you wouldn't be susceptible to fake news. Like, I, I think it's it's fine. And is Human Factors cast fake news? I don't know. We post what we find and whatever's interesting and pertains to Human Factors, but who knows? Basically, you think you might be able to spot it a mile away, right? Well, what if that news came from someone you trusted? Right. So a study from the American Press Institute found that participants were more likely to believe a fake news story on social media if it was shared by a source that they trusted, like U.S. Surgeon General or Oprah. In a study coined uh, the Media Insight Study, the American Press Institute showed participants mock stories on social media that were from sources that they trusted. They found that if participants trusted the source 50 percent of the time, they believed in the fake news story. Now, this whole fake news thing is really interesting to me, and it's especially interesting to me when you can take a source and, and sort of attribute that uh, trust factor to them. Do you have an opinion on this, Nick? Because you were talking about this a little earlier, right, with, with uh, slap, slap a news story on somebody you trust and, and it's news. Yeah, I mean, it is definitely something that, you know, even other people, like if somebody else believes a source to be true and then they share it to somebody else, it's just a chain of incorrect, you know, information. But like, I feel like just having something like that come from an original source is almost unheard of. It's like trying to contact a famous person. You have no idea where it actually comes from. Well, and I mean, even Human Factors cast, as uh, you know, as as good as we'd like to make ourselves out, we do take a lot of the sources secondhand. So all the sources that you find on on uh, social media, those are secondhand sources from the feeds that we follow. But that's also how we find a lot of our stuff. I mean, we try to post the uh, the original link when we can, but um. If you trust Human Factors Cast, then it's real news, right? <laughs> yep, it's all real here. <laughs> all His right. His name's not really Nick, though. It's, it's uh, I don't know, Murloc. Murloc. Murloc, indeed. All right, well, that is going to be it for today. Uh, you know, if our music wants to come in. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I don't know why it's so low. It's so low. Like Han Solo. There you go. <laughs> That's it for today, everyone. If you have any suggestions for games, topic, news stories that you want us to cover, you can follow us on all over our social media. Uh, we've been more active on all those things. So head on over to our Human Factors Cast Facebook page, comment on our SoundCloud, reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. You can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're really daring and brave, leave us a voicemail at 901 646 1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If it's family appropriate, we will play it on the show. Uh, you can also support us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes, make those reviews good. It helps us out, helps you out, help us out. Uh, the Google Play Store, we're on there too, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. On behalf of Blake Arnsdorf, uh, you can find him at Don't Panic UX on Twitter. Nick Porter, thank you for joining me today in Blake Arnsdorf. Uh, his hour of need nick where can our listeners find you you can find me on my youtube page under viaco kala great as for me i've been your host nick rome you can find me on linkedin or twitter at nick underscore rome thanks again for tuning in to human factors cast until next time nick we sign off with it depends can you say it depends for me just it depends it depends it depends it depends